You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. It's very well connected. So we've got Brighton and London and Lincolnshire and Nottinghamshire and Leicestershire. Uh, some of the figures are dead now and some are still about. Um, but it's just massive, massive money that you're dealing with. So every week it's a few hundred grand I'd be collecting. And then you've got other drivers as well. A lot of them are doing drop-offs. And I phone home, you know, what's happening, what's happening? Mum goes, ah, oh, they've all been arrested. He said, all of them, your brother, everybody. It's all been over the papers. Your dad, sees, he's in prison at the minute. And I think, shit. Uh, and she says, oh, he said, your brother, they, they got your brother, they got him here. The police have come for you. So I head over to Amsterdam, uh, go to the safe house on the north side on, in our plane. Uh, and then knock the door and a guy called Sowerby answers, a lot next lifer. He's there. He's one of my dad's workers there, a reliable guy. And he says, look, your, dad, your dad's been shot. He's been shot in the chest. Um, he says, in a bad way, we don't know if he's going to pull through. Uh, they eventually get bail, and all of them are going to be released. Except at the gates, as they're being released, my dad gets called back. He says, hold on a minute. He's not allowed out the final gate. He says, you're kind of wanted for extradition. You're, you're Tony Spencer? He says, you wanted for extradition to Holland, you know, for murder. He's wanted in England for the conspiracy. He's wanted in Holland for the murder, questioned about another murder. He's got seven years in Spain. It looks about as bad as it could possibly be. And at that point, not a lot of people are really going to help. Ben, we're on. Okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> and today's guest, we've got Jason Wilson. How right, are you, Jason? Yeah, very good. Thanks for sending me your book. We'll plug straight away the old man in me. Which is you and your dad. Your dad was a drug smuggler, bank robber. You get involved right. in the family business. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> but phenomenal stories in there, mad stories. People getting shot in Holland, people getting killed, drugs, all the madness. Yeah. There's a lot there. Yeah. First and foremost, how are you? Uh, brilliant. Great at the minute. You all right? <laughs> yeah, good, mate. It's good to have you up in Scotland. Yeah, not been here a while, but uh -huh. yeah. Dropping money last time I come here. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's nice. <laughs> Same yeah. days, mate. Uh, yeah, different. All different now. But as you know, I'll go back to the start of my guests, where you grew up and how it all began. Okay, that's that's Coventry then, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, I'm from Cov, my mum and dad are from Cov. Um, my dad was a motorcycle mechanic when he started out. Mum, she was a secretary. Uh, she wanted a family and he wanted to be a millionaire, basically. That was his big ambition. You're not going to do that doing bikes. Um, so we started to do a bit of buying and selling. That sort of thing, a bit of ducking and diving, got to know all the faces around there. Uh, and for a few years later, when I'm born, he's inside doing two years. He's got uh, got caught some copper, uh, two tons of copper, out in a in a cottage. He was they were melting it down or doing something. We got two years for that. Uh, but then when he comes out, he starts doing um, secondhand shops. Uh, he's, you know, he's going to be a straight businessman from that point on. Uh, and that's what he starts to do in the next couple of years. He starts setting up these little second-hand shops uh, around Coventry, Harnell Lane and everywhere. Uh, and at this uh, this time, it should be said, his name's Shipley at this time, because um, later he'll change it to Spencer. Um, so he starts setting these up, and then kind of Lloyd's and Westminster's, and they're named after banks. And years later, the rumour is these are the these are banks that he robs, because uh, he, he seems to have a, like a double life. He's a businessman, but a bit of a villain as well. Um, so those first few years, I, I don't see him a great deal. He's always coming and going. He's just kind of a distant figure, uh, always at work. And then all of a sudden, we have to move house. We kind of go live with an aunt and uh, me and my brother and my sister. Um, so in that period, is we move house. So, And every Sunday, we start visiting him. He's gone to a place that uh, I, I'm told is a college, which is a prison, uh, Lay Hill down in Gloucestershire. So we start going there every Sunday, um, and that's really where I get to know him. Because up to that point, he's, he's just, uh, he's your dad coming and going. And at that point, uh, we start sitting at a table, just like we are now. Uh, let's go back. Uh, and we start sitting at the table, and he starts just talking about what he's doing. He's doing all these business courses. He's doing, uh, he's doing his O-levels, his A-levels, that sort of thing. Uh, smuggling in cigarettes for inmates. Um, so it's all, it's all kind of very good, but he's very idealistic and he's going to do these big businesses when he does come out. Um, when did you realise it was a prison he was in? Um, 
I didn't. I never. I wouldn't do for a couple of years. It was later he went to Long Larton. I'd notice a prison. Uh, when How he, were you at school? Uh, I was in Coventry. Me and my brother, we were, yeah. we were in Cov. Like I said, working class area and everything. Um, and like I said, it was a normal family life. We just lived with my, my uncle Bill and my aunt. Uh, quite standard upbringing. But we never really knew what he was doing. Like I said, businessman villain, really. Mm-hmm. Um, he said, uh, he's at Layhill for two years. And he's always coming back in the summer. The summer never really comes. It's kind of, you know, you know next month, next month, next month. Uh, and then eventually I'll come home one day and there's a big van outside the house and there's a few workers there and he's around the front and he's he's working on the engine and he just says all right I say all right and that's it he's back he's been away for like two odd years and it's like just nothing it's kind of all very understated and that's the way it was very cold relationship not really he, had a, I was he wasn't he wasn't too. emotional like a modern modern fathers are quite emotional yeah you know all that hoggy i love your son and all and the people in those days never did that sort of thing it's like bang the ear and, yeah, yeah yeah it's like you kind of get in line uh but you never really had to do that because you had a lot of respect for him uh big burly guy all very sharp kind of very sharp mind very meticulous real discipline very ordered and that kind of counts he was like that with motorcycles but later he's like that with cookers and he's like that with drugs later as well Mm-hmm. whatever he does there's always a lot of order to it so he's kind of it's just he's constantly doing lists as well so it's like when we used to go to the prison all up his arms he'd have these lists on both arms and you get to the prison and there's a case the first bit is always you know you know how was it how was it, how was the drive and how's the car and how's you you know all the normal things and he'd do that no matter what if i saw him in prison in 10 20 years time, it was always the same and years later when he got, when he got shot it was the same thing i'll go see him and he'd say you know how's your trip and how's the car and all this sort of stuff it was always the same sort of thing. Very practical guy, but always kind of sharp sense of humour, quite dark sense of humour. He'd laugh about anything, you know. You yeah. cut your hand, he'd have a laugh about it, and someone's in an accident, almost lose a leg, he'd laugh about it. It was, it was kind of that sort of dark sense of humour he had. Um, when did you realise he was in a life of crime? It wouldn't be till really till he went to Long Larton later. What age were you? Uh, I was about eleven then. He got done for a bank robbery, and at Long Larton it was a case of. Whereas earlier when we used to go to Lay Hill, it was like a family day out. You know, you take food, you have a picnic. It was, it was fantastic. I, like, you know, kind of family all together. You think, wow, this is, this is great. The highlight of the month, really. Yep. But a few years later, this is after he's done all these businesses and cookers. He's, he's, he's made millions of pounds doing these cookers and these gymnasiums. And that, but then it kind of starts to implode. He's always over-expanding. He's only been out of jail for a few years. And he goes very big, very fast. And he becomes a real dominant figure in Cov. Uh, so far Gosford Street, he has uh, cooker warehouses. One of them he burns down for the insurance money. Uh, that should have gone well, but didn't, because uh, then CID get involved. And he'd done fires before and always gotten away with it, you see. Mm-hmm. Always claimed on the insurance. This time they interfered and uh, everything comes, started to come crashing down. So he, robs, he starts robbing banks, but then he gets done on this silly one, which is someone grasses, us up, grasses him up. It's a cog bouncer who... I recently found out, thought my dad never knew, but my dad always knew who it was. Um, so he gets 10 years for that. And at that point, we start visiting him at Long Larton. And at that point, you've kind of, you know, you're jailed, you can't really hide it. When I was a, when I was six or seven, you could say he was at college. And it's like all the kids are told, your dad's away working, he's on an oil rig or mm-hmm. whatever. But Long Larton, now he's in prison. It's all life, there's a lot of IRA there. Uh, quite a few murderers and stuff, all that sort of thing. Um, and at Long Larton, uh, it's, a little, it's very different there. You go there, you have loads of mates in the first month. So when you, get to, when you go inside, it's a case of lots of people want to visit you initially. And once they've done that, they don't really go back because it's like they've got a story to tell. Um, and it's, it's a case of, it really comes down to family. And that's what it was like with him. It was all my mum's family. They would muck in and help us out. And my dad's family didn't do that much. Um, um, I think they just kind of, it's like when he'd been at Layhill, they just left us to it. It was always my mum's family who came up. Uh, my dad's family was like, well, that's just the way it goes. Um, and they're very defensive of him. It's like, son's, he's been in prison a few times and now I'm robbery and they would kind of stick up for him mm-hmm. and they kind of treat my mum and that as if it was their fault somehow. Yeah. You know, always blaming somebody else. See, if he was making millions, he had all the gems. Why did he need to rob banks? Because he overspent, he, rather than be, he's very impatient. It was like, I want to do something now. I haven't got the money now, I'll just borrow it. And it was a way he expanded very quickly because, um, really should have consolidated he never went through that stage you know when you do a business and you consolidate you think well now i need to build up some funds and then i'll start expanding again he never really did that and because he mixed with a lot of villains it's very easy for him to you know borrow money and 
you know, he'd borrow the money from banks and then he'd go to, well, I suppose you'd call them loan sharks, but they were mates of his. Mm -hmm. But he'd still pay interest on it. it like part of being mates is you don't take, don't take advantage of mates that way. They would, would all, the other way around, they would take advantage of him. It was kind of, uh, it's a bit yeah. odd that was. So a lot of it was impatience. Um, he had two gyms that kind of opened by Miss World, Mr. Universal. That was a real big deal at the time. Um, but then the women's money, the women's gym makes decent money. But then the men's kind of just loses it. And he says, you know, stay patient with it all. And he's still doing the cookers, but his attention switched. And it was the cookers that were the, was the gold mine. That's where people always said you should have stuck with it because you're making like tens and tens of thousands every week. And you wanted to expand. You could have just stuck with it. It was a gold mine. Um, but anyway, he robs the bank, ends up inside, got 10 years. Uh, we go visit him month by month. And then gradually things start to break down. Because normally the myth is that other villains step in and help the family and all this. They don't really do that. Um, there's no benefit for them in helping his family. So we're kind of left to it for a few years. And that's basically things just start crumbling from there. Um, and eventually they'll get divorced and go their separate ways. Uh, we'll move house because the house was a, is a shithole, basically. We've been re really left in it. And uh, we moved to a place called Ilston, which is a real soft working class area. Uh, and everything's kind of good again. And then a couple of years pass and there's a knock at the door and I'm sitting there watching blockbusters at the time. It's kind of, I'm a, I'm a student by this time, like 16 years old. And I go to the door and I open it and he's just standing there in a suit. He's, he's just got out and it's, uh, he just comes in, has a glass of water and, you know, gives me like a, he kind of gives me, a, kind of pats me on the shoulder. <laughs> 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 yeah. It's been away six and a half years. Yeah. Uh, but he was always very understated. Like I said, he wasn't, it wasn't that emotional generation. Mm -hmm. It was like, I'm back now, I'm, you know, I'm going to get working, I've got stuff, I've got loads of, I've always got ideas, my dad. Um, so, and then he zips off, and you think, well, that's it. It's kind of, everything's changed, he's carrying on just like nothing's happened. And over the next few weeks and months, I get to know him a little bit. Um, start going out driving with him, which is what I used to do as a kid. I used to go to work with him on Saturdays, me and my brother. And we used to go off driving, and you go to meet all these people and that, and it was always, occasionally... I mean, he had, he had an office, never used it. So all the meetings were on car parks and end of gardens and warehouses and the occasional pub and around their house. We never used an office. And I'd realised there was reasons for that later. Mm -hmm. um, but he starts to do the same thing again. Um, I'd go off on meetings with him. Except this, is, this time's a little bit different. I'm 16. He's kind of, he's watching the mirrors on the car and it's like, can you, can you just check no one's with us as we're... Surveillance. Yeah, he's very surveillance savvy, it turns out. So he's kind of checking for all these, and I'm kind of getting used to that. Keep your mouth shut. You don't say this. And I ain't got a clue what he's doing, but he's talking about making a hell of a lot of money. It's like he's going to make hundreds of thousands within a couple of months. Uh, don't really know what it is. Is it drugs, diamonds? Uh, at that age, you don't really know. Mm -hmm. um, and there was one clue. One day he asked me to copy some thing on counterfeit dollars. Fake money? Yeah, just you just want to show some people there. Uh, and I'd normally say, get 10 sets. He said that with everything. Whenever he said you to buy anything, it was always get 10 you don't have to go back then. He's got all these different places to put them. Um, so it, it, it will turn out it's counterfeit dollars he's doing. And he's, he's got the plates and the press and he's got a gang. And when he was in prison, he was doing watercolour painting. A lot of that was so you can get hold of the papers. So it was kind of that they use for dollars and the inks as well. And he's got this little gang of, you know, ex-prisoners and he's kind of heading them. And he's got this international distribution because uh, he's been inside all this time. He knows a lot of the Irish and a lot of the Dutch um, and he's going to, a few Americans, he's going to send it all around the world, this, these dollars. Um, but he's got this 24 hour surveillance on him, as it turns out. And they're on him from day one. Um, so he's on pages and phone, you know, phone boxes. Don't use, I don't think my bells were about then. So it's all, go, you know, you check his page, you've got to get to a call box. And that's all it was. Every day you went out with him, that's what it was. Then all of a sudden he just disappears. It's kind of, you get home and mum says, oh, he does have to shoot off. He's uh, been police raids everywhere. Um, so he was, off, he was off on the run uh, and just got used to life without him for a while again. Who was it for you at 16 when you started going to meetings? Was it excitement for you or were you scared? No, it was just the same. I did it when I was a kid. It was the same old thing. You meet these guys who are like the cough people and they're so-called, some of them are gangsters or villains or rogues or some of them were just genuine businessmen. It was something I'd always done since I was a kid. So it was always quite normal to see these people. Mm -hmm. And it was the same with the counterfeit. You just go meeting people. It's just, they're just fellas. Uh, but they've all they're all self-employed. None of my dad's friends really work for other people. They're all and the same as him. They're all self-employed. Always had their own businesses and always had their own things on the side. 
It was just there. When you used to watch Minder, you know, you see that uh, ducking and diving culture of, uh, it was very like that. Mm-hmm. There were your car lots and all that sort of thing. So for me, it was quite normal. And at the time I was, I was at college, I was gone to study art at college. Um, so he goes on the run for a year. Turns out in that time he'd gone to Leicester. What was he on the run for? It's on for the dollars his raids had happened there looking for him. So he had to get out of Coventry. He didn't go far, he only went to Leicester. But then he, he takes up as a lodger and he's under the name Pat McKenna. And he says, you know, I'm an accountant. And he starts lodging at this place, starts going out with the landlady. Before you know it, he's seeing the landlady. <laughs> uh, Batting for ladies, man, is he? He was. He was a, he was a good looking guy. Smooth. Yeah, very smooth, very charming, very neat, real great manners, real polite. Um, and he said, wherever he went, he could, he could attract women, but when you've got money, and you've got power, you, you kind of get yeah. it massively. Uh, so it was always kind of like, they never searched women out, but they always kind of went after him and it was like, I can help you with this. And they're trying to, so he ends up going out, this, land, this landlady, um, she thinks it's Pat McKenna, an accountant. He comes home every day at six o'clock. Reason is he can't be out after six o'clock because he's worried about getting, you know, roped in on something. Uh, he doesn't use the phone. He just sits and watching videos like he did when I was a kid. Uh, we always watched gangster movies when we were kids. We never watched like you know the Disney stuff together, and we had videos and that. And he'd watch all like Papillon and Brew Baker and uh, lots of Steve McQueen. He was always anti heroes. That's what he liked. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what he did with her anyway. And then all of a sudden he doesn't come back, and it turns out he's been caught. Um, I think ringing cars at that point, and uh, he gets remanded to Winston Green. They find out who he is, charge him with the dollars, and he's facing a big sentence because uh, it's a hell of a lot. Um, and by that point, I'm up in Manchester. I'm an animator at a place called Catalyst Pictures. Uh, I'm, I'm working up there. Uh, and I come down to see him when I finished up there and I go see him on a visit. And it's like, you know, fuck's sake, we're here again. You know, it's like... Mm-hmm. Groundhog Day. Yeah. It's, uh, so you go in and you're kind of, he's going to take the lead of everything because he's always kind of in charge. He always knows what he's doing. He has no doubts about anything. Uh, he explains what's going on with this dollar. He's been fitted up, of course. Um, I know he hasn't because I used to go driving with him. Uh, and then he explains that, that he's had the papers come in and explains what it is. And he says, uh, he's had a pen off one of the screws, a bit of paper, and he writes down 250 million. He says, that's what they're accusing me of, of you know, of counterfeiting. And I think, well, fuck's sake, if... And he laughs about it. He's like, yeah, you know, I'd never do that much. And he oh. just laughs it off. And I'm like, folks, you, you're never going to get out. You know, 250 million, it's American dollars as well. It's not like some crappy currency. Mm-hmm. Americans take it really seriously. Could they have get involved, the Americans? Well, they did get involved. They send them, because it's a counterfeit case, they have to send mm-hmm. FBI agents over. And I'm told, I'm told later, they look at the dollars and they say, okay, these are fair enough. They'll show us the counterfeits. And they're told, no, you've got the counterfeits. They're the ones he's doing. They, the dollars at the end got really good. And that's why they were really concerned. They wanted the plates. And they stayed over to try and get the plates and he wouldn't give them up. He was like, well, fuck you. You're not, you're not getting them. You're mm-hmm. kind of... He had that sort of attitude. It's very anti-authority. He didn't like the police at all. Did they try and make a deal? Give the police lesser sentence? I think they might have done... They did, they're supposed to have done something like that, but he was just adamant, you're not having them. Mm-hmm. Uh, he might have been just a look, you drop the whole case and you can have them, but you're not just going to have them to knock a year off because I think I'm going to get off anyway. How good were they, the dollars? You don't really see, it's usually fake 20s. Fake well, the, tens. the early ones weren't that good, but the ones at the end were supposed to be outstanding. You know, because he kind of worked them up. He was a good yeah. copyist as a kid. He used to do art. Very good copyist. My daughter's like that as well. Where they'll just, you know, take a photograph and they'll reproduce it perfectly. And he, he could do that as a kid. Is that where you get that from? Yeah, uh, that's an artistic mm-hmm. street that goes through the family, yeah. I suppose. But co- copyist, it, you know, if you're going to be a counterfeit, that's what you want to be able to do. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why he was good at that. And he had, like I said, he had, he was, had that method of very detailed and everything he ever did. Is kind of so when he was inside the ideal environment to study. Yeah, he studied the dollars and the inks and everything, and there's watercolor painting. You know, fucking Robert doing watercolor mm-hmm. painting. He's just he just want papers and you know all this sort of stuff to experiment with. It wasn't your dad who put you into art by any chance, was it? <laughs> it wasn't your dad who put you into art by any oh, chance, was it? Or maybe indirectly <laughs> <laughs> planting yeah. seeds from a young age. If yeah, that my, my it was a safe outlet, I guess. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, so. so He's there and he's got this and he's going to battle it though. He's, very, he's got very good legally. I know, know that by this time. It's like when he's out, he gets mates, you know, can you have a look at this case and all this? Because when he's inside, he's a lot of legal cases. And he does law as well. And he was at Leigh Hill, he studied law in Long Lart and he's got all these certificates and everything. When he's in, he always studies. That's one thing. He's a model prisoner, studies his arse off, makes stacks of contacts. That's what prisons fought like. And it's that thing where he told me it was a college earlier. And I think it is his college. To him, it was. You go there to improve. That's what you get to prison for. 
um, and he'll do this in this sentence, except he's going to stay at Winston Green with a lot of Irish. Um, and that ties in because the people have done it with the serious uh, regional crime squad, you know, the West Midlands people, the absolutely crook, and they fit up a lot of the Irish. Uh, and they've done his case. And he says they've done the same thing on his. When you go to all the, you know, the police notes, they're all fucking backdated and bits added and, you know, switch this round and switch that round. And there's all that sort of thing going on. So he says, hey, well, I'm going to get this thrown out. So that'd be another reason why he's not going to give up the plates. Um, mm -hmm. So he, there's a long period towards trial. The trial eventually comes. It goes on for about five months. And a month from the end, it's going really well, except he's missed something. You know, when you, when you write a piece of paper and you press down below, it make, leaves a slight impression, doesn't it? And he realised they've got some evidence. And when they do a test on it, it's going to come up, come up what he's written. So in front of his lawyers... He grabs this and he puts it in his mouth and he swallows it. And of course, at that point, they've got to step down because they've just they've seen him do it. Um, so at that point, they step down and he represents himself for the last month. And he does all the he does all the cross examination and everything. Um, does his summary and all that. Um, does work very well apparently, but he gets guilty and he gets eleven and a half years. And the judge tells him he's really intelligent and everything, but he's still giving him eleven and a half years. He's got two years for contempt of court. You know, this uh, perverting the course of justice because he swallowed this bit of paper and he gets nine years for the counterfeit and they never get the plates back. Um, so at that point, he goes back to Winston Green, finishes some legal cases doing for the inmates, some of the Irish there. And then he kind of basically, I think he, I think he ends up, uh, might be Featherstone or, no, Whitemore. He goes to Whitemore Cate. Uh, and by that point, I'm... By the time he's in that, I'm about 20. I'm working at a place called Amblimation in London. It's a animation, Spielberg's animation studio in Acton. I'm working out there, and I think, if fuck's sake, this seems... I mean, it's a big company, but it seems really insignificant because he's got done for this. And just to go work for... So I always felt working for someone was something... I, I was, felt a bit shit about it, to be honest. I had a great job. But for my dad, you work for yourself, and you know what I mean? You create stuff. So in the couple of months of him doing that, I, qu I kind of quit my job and I went back and I started this, trying to get an animation studio going. And during the whole period that he'd be serving this sense of the count, but that's what I would be doing. I'd be trying to, I suppose, kind of make, make it back, I suppose, trying to build up this animation studio. And I'd do it in Cobb, then go to Birmingham, then go to London, do TV ads and all that, you know, keep updating him. Nearly made some major breakthroughs when you get like a million pound deal for something, because that's kind of what, what I wanted to achieve. Uh, but all the time he's kind of doing his sentence, making contacts. And I don't really know the details of what he's doing. I still visit him occasionally. Uh, I get in the shit the odd time he helps me out business-wise with the bank and everything. Because uh, he's good at that sort of stuff. But I don't realise while he's inside, he's kind of starting in the drug game slowly, starting to build up. He, I think at Whitemore, he's a cate prisoner. And he gets the cleaning job on the uh, visitor's room. And there's Tampax machines. And he gets some of the female visitors to come in and start putting nine bars in the Tampax machine. And after all the visitors go, he goes and gets the nine bars. And so he starts doing things like that, just starts building up. Um, and by the time he gets to a, like a, he goes to his cat B, cat C, but each time he's getting stronger and bigger. And by the time he gets to cat T, it's really a party. You know, it's like an off, they used to call this place the off license. Um, I'm in London at the time. Um, I don't see him that much because like I said, it's just, he's moving around a lot and I've been moving around a lot. Um, but then all of a sudden he's, he phones me one day, he's on home leave. And all, I think I only get the call because I've been avoiding, I mean, I'm in debt at the time. And he, if he, you know, pick up the phone, he's like, well, when the fuck aren't you answering your phone? And I'm like, you know, I've, I've been on the tube or, you know, he says, you know, I'm back at the weekend. You, you, know, you want to come over with your brother? And so I'm going to start getting to know him all over again. Because up to that point, it, it's been a little bit mixed, to be honest, because it's, is this, Incredible businessman, you go visit him, absolutely charming, brilliant. But then I hear I heard a lot of things over the years that weren't that great, which oh. were a lot of it to do with guns, you know, like moving guns and relatives finding guns. My um um I think my cousin Neil he found like a handgun in the back of the wardrobe and there were guns under the steps at their house, and then there was transporting guns, things to do with the IRA, and then uh one of his friends was on about it when he was younger, you know, kneecapping people, like when people have grasped. He'd been involved in a few things like that, you know, kind of nasty stuff. And I asked him about this when he was inside. I just wrote it and I thought, well, you know, what's all this? Didn't, didn't matter about the prison sense. So I just wanted to get a reaction out of him. Uh, and he just says, look, when you're older, you'll understand. But a lot of it's crap what you're being told. And so by the time he's gets, I'm like 26, and he's been released again. He's in the drug game. It's a case of, a start, you know, starting over. 
I really need to get to know him again. Yeah. Uh, give him a fair shout because by this point, I'm like 26 and I realise the world's not an idealistic place. It's very difficult. You know, you kind of work and work. You don't always get what you want. And that's just the way the world is. And we're all kind of flawed. And so I kind of drop my standards a bit and start realising, no, you've got to start accepting how he is because it's part of growing up at the end of the day. How hard is it for you, though, that your dad always in and out your life and then just showing up out the blue? Like, it must have fucked with your own emotions, especially you've got a, a positive living. You've got a, like, you're not doing bad stuff. You're, you're not in the family business yet. You're, you're just doing you. Like, how hard is that for you that, to then still have a contact with your dad, even though you know what he was doing was wrong? It's kind of a, an emotion. The period where he went long line, that was the difficult period. When mm -hmm. he was laying hill, that was great. I, my brother, it might have been more difficult because he was older. He knew what was going on. I didn't. When we went to Long Lark, that was really unpleasant because you realise how isolated you are and how much you rely on money and how difficult it was for my mum as well and how difficult it was for my brother. A lot of stigma and that. And the only way you get through those periods, they're quite dark periods, it's just denial, really. You just, this understatement where you just think, well, things ain't too bad. You know, it's all you've ever known, so you're not going to compare it too much. Other people might, they're, well, you know, fucking poor dears, you know. They, but to us, it, this was normal. So, Do you think your dad talked down that life a lot? Talked down that he, the, uh, that life, especially to his son, like just because he was such a sm smooth, char char charismatic character, yeah. where it was just a normal life. But obviously, you know now the destruction it causes. Like, do you think he played it down a bit? I think he, yeah, he did because it, it was that kind of old school keeping it in your own environment. He was dealing mostly with villains. Mm. He never. It's like if you got involved in thieving, it was never off ordinary people. It was that old school. You rob from factories and stuff, and you take lorries and stuff. You don't rob off what you, ordinary people. It's kind of, I mean, if he comes in here and he met you and you were struggling, he'd be like, well, you know, you need a car. I've got a spare car if you want it. And he'd, he'd be often to do your favours. Mm -hmm. He did that wherever he went. He know, ordinary people, he was absolutely, that's the way he was. His, his thing was always authorities, institutions. Some models back in the day. Yeah. It's changed days now. It's changed days now with people at like the village and that now. It's everything's <clears throat> too many grasses. Everybody hating on each other, turning on each other, backstabbing, like, Back in the day, I think, even though they were still doing all, yeah. there was more respect for your elders, your parents, like kids, women. Like now, yeah. people are just look, a young girl in Liverpool who's just been shot there, nine yeah. years old. Do you know what I mean? You wouldn't yeah. hear that stuff in the seventies. I mean, we go near that stuff a, later, but back then, his old, his old area, they were, they were all the criminals could consider themselves to be business people, and that's how they saw themselves. That's how they behaved, and that's why it was so easy to believe that when I was a kid, because that's the way they acted all the stuff they go off and rob banks and stuff it was always in you know, a higher echelon they kept it to themselves keep your mouth shut no one grasses and if you grass you really you know uh, yeah. and the grass in and informing comes a big problem later especially when you go to the drug yeah. server did they ever tell you to keep on the straight and narrow stick to your art stick to your animation or the tcu as becoming part of the family business um I think he was very. I was, people would later tell me, always proud of what you're doing. You work for Spielberg, and he's, you know, he's very proud. He never told me to my face. He never, he never said anything like that. I just assumed, in his world, you know, a grown men drawing for a living is something. It's not a real job, and I kind of always felt he he kind of thought like that. To him, a real job was you get something, you make something, you sell something, you take a bit of daring, you know, and to him, that's what work was really. Mm -hmm. You really put yourself out there, out there, and quite fearless. Um, so when I get to 26, I'm, re I'm really struggling financially. You know, you know, kind of up here one minute, down there the next. I'm very much like that. Mm -hmm. And then he suddenly appears. He's on home leaves over and eating with his new wife. This is a wife number three. And I've got to say him, and he's, he's kind of like how I should be. He's kind of real buzzing. You're like a 20-year-old. He's got loads of energy. He's got plenty of money. There's all cigarettes, sleeves of cigarettes all around the house. You know, he's kind of, that's because that's what he's doing. He's selling cigarettes. He's got, yeah, he's got his mobile phones. He's got all these SIM cards. Keep switching the SIMs and he's doing all these deals and people have to come near the house because he ain't got time. He's on home leave. So he's only got a couple of days. So people having to come and drop money for him and he's then the money comes in. Then someone visits, he gives them money for stuff and helping them out and everything. You think he's the inmate, people should be helping him, but it's the other way around. He's doing exceptionally well. And on the phone, it's all cigarettes. So as you know, got 20 embassies and I've got 10 super kings. We'll sort all this out and just seems like cigarettes. And my brother thought that, I thought that. You don't realise it's a code they're using and that's how it works at that age. Because I'm 26, I'm still a bit naive that way. Um, so he comes out and he, like I said, he's this really young fella. And I start to change my ideas a little bit. Uh, I'm still working in London and I start coming up every weekend once it gets released. And every time I come up, he's got a new car and a new worker. 
a new place. New wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a new girlfriend. <laughs> He always had a few girlfriends. <laughs> though, that's something that took a bit of getting used to. Uh, but yeah, each, each week kind of come back and you think, Fuck, it's, you know, I'm kind of grafting, I'm doing it straight. And whatever he's doing, he's making, way, he's making all the money that I dreamt of making when I was younger and what he, he was making. When he, and he seems to be doing it so easily. And it's like I said, yeah, I go there and every time, you know, you want to come off for a couple of hours, a few meets, go see a few people. And we pop by all these different apartments and, you know, you're driving your car, you go to one place, park up, walk, walk a street away, get another car, drive off. You know, it's all surveillance savvy and everything still. A bit more familiar with that by that point. Uh, but it's just the expansion every weekend. And then gradually I decide I'm coming back to Cov. I'm in London, I'm, I'm really struggling. So I come back to Cov, get a little studio there, intending to stay on the straight and narrow. But then he'll drop by and he'll like, you know, your filing cabinet, you mind if I leave some stuff with you? And he'll just leave it, come back the next day, 100 quid, just thanks, you know. And I was like, no, no, you need, you need your dad and everything. No, no, you just keep it. And he's like that, you know, just favours all the time. And he starts doing that. And he says, you know, just don't look, watch your prints and everything. And that's what I do. And then one day I'll just go and have a look and it's kind of white bars, you know, like base, amphetamine base. I, th I didn't know what it was. I thought, fucking, yeah. At the time I think, you know, you watch, uh, you watch Al Pacino, it's, not, it's all powder. You think, mm. well, that's fucking solid. What's, okay, it's not none of my business. He's holding up for someone, just none of my business. He's doing cigarettes anyway. So then he starts, uh, you know, you're doing anything this evening, you want to just pit, pop the brine, I've got someone with some money down there, just pop down, yeah. Okay, I'll pop down, i get 30 grand, bring it back, like, fucking 30 grand. Can't wait to get it back to him. I'll, you know, he's like, no, just, just keep it for the minute, get it in the morning. He's so casual about it. And he's got drivers doing this sort of thing, going around the country. And at this time, I think he's doing cigarettes. But I start, each evening, I start just doing, going collecting money for him. And then these short one night, uh, short drivers, because he's, Loads of drivers, he's always getting short. He just asked me if I can just go down to Dunstable. He just says he got some cigarettes to drop. And then he says, you know, lowers his voice and just says, look, the cigarettes, that, you know, it's hash and it's, you know, it's uh, your amphetamine. These are hash, there's just some nine bars. You just put them there, stick them under your seat and just drop them down to the fella. Um, let him take him, give him 10 minutes, then phone back, he'll bring the money for you. I did that, and that was the first drop I did. And after that point... I was at the studio and each evening just ring, you know, you up to anything, you want to go driving? And I'll just go off driving and gradually that's how I started working for him. But the better thing after that was I started driving where I was to be like a chauffeur because he never drove himself because he'd got to be hands free for the phone. So I started driving him every day as well. And during that period, that's when he started schooling me what he was doing. Because uh, I was aware of the surveillance and all this sort of stuff, but then he starts teaching me all the fine details and everything. And he's like, the more you know, the safer you'll be anyway, so you may as well. And I like being around him. He's been away for like about the last 15 years. It's been away 13 years. So I think, you know, it's a weird sort of way I'm spending me, I'm spending time with my dad sort of thing, you know, like you would when you're a kid and you think you're kind of making up for lost time. Except it's all a little bit different. You're kind of, you're going to drug meets and stuff and you're grabbing money and everything and you're doing surveillance and you're burying stuff and then you're going back and getting it a few days later and it's all the unusual stuff. And then he's off doing mixes now and then, which I don't want any part of because that's, you know, that's... That's like that breaking bad where people come in when you're doing a mix, you're really fucked. So, so it's, it's a variety of stuff that's going on and there's loads of workers and there's something happening every week. Um, and you're meeting all these different villains from all the different cities. Um, it's very well connected. So we've, we've got Brighton and London and Lincolnshire and Nottinghamshire and Leicestershire. Um, some of the figures are dead now and some are still about. Um, but it's just massive, massive money that you're dealing with. So every week it's a few hundred grand I'd be collecting. And then you've got other drivers as well. A lot of them are doing drop-offs. Um, and it varies from week to week. Like I said, I'd have weeks where I'd earn less money, but I'd be driving him and I'd be spending time with him. We'd be burying stuff and all this sort of thing. And that was, that was kind of fun in a strange sort of way. Um, so, yeah, I'm kind of nostalgic about it in a strange way. Is that when it becomes the attraction? Like you're getting to spend time with your dad, you're starting to make a bit of money. Listen, dropping all gear and that, and if you're burying money, yeah. bigger, or, or digging up holes to bury <laughs> stashes like you're... It's a, it's a turn on you feel as if if you watch the films with your dad then you feel as if you're in part of a movie like as it becomes such an attraction that you actually forgot what you were doing and you're just so concentrated on the buzz of it um so i, I didn't really have that kind of buzz mm -hmm. i think he did but i was kind of i was very cautious and i thought the course more cautious i'm the safer i am on this but i thought i thought i, I just kind of like the business side of it my brother liked the practical side but i liked all the you know when you go to meetings and you realize how he's negotiating, how they're paying, how it's all worked out. 
uh, and how he sells. And I kind of liked all that sort of stuff. And then the legal stuff he'd be doing and all the surveillance stuff. So intellectually, I, lo I liked all that side. That's what I liked. The actual bit of the burying, the, the unfair, I never liked the unfair because, you know, occasionally you go places and say, look, I've got, a, I've got two keys. I've got to make it three keys. Go in the other room. I'm going to need to do a quick make some sort. And you think, for fuck's sake, I, I ain't doing this again. And there were little instances like that where there were little signs of me distancing off. But the big thing was, like any rational person, once you've got something to lose, because at the start I, I didn't have anything to lose, after a while you've got something to lose, lose you think, well, why am I doing this bit? Because this is real risky. If you get caught with Amphet, you've got five years, you know, just driving it. So I start to back off from that. I think, well, I won't do that anymore. Uh, I'll just do the hash and the, and the paperwork, you know, what the money. Because um, at, the, at the time I, I met Sammy, who's my future wife, and I think, I've got something good going now. I've got money, got a missus, got a place. Uh, don't need to be risking it all for a bit of unfair. So I stopped doing that. But then I start thinking about the hash as well. I thought, well, the paperwork, there's almost no risk with paperwork. So I start retreating from the hash a little bit as well. Um, and he's got loads of other drivers anyway. So, and I'm still driving him occasionally. And we go abroad and everything. He get, once he's got his license back, there's loads of trips abroad. Everyone's got to have a pass. Every driver's got to have a passport. And basically you're going to Spain and Amsterdam quite frequently. And you've got to drive everywhere because... You can't leave records on flights, so it's a lot of driving. Um, but again, I'm going abroad with my dad. I never went on holiday with him, and this is like a kind of like a holiday. You know, you go off, you can see some meetings, you come back, and then good start arriving. And he was always hopping like Spain to Holland to here because he was doing the he was doing the importation, but he was also doing the buying and the supply. And he was wearing three hats, which is a lot to do, and you can't do it for very long, really. Really, you needed like a family, or you know, which mm -hmm. I mean, you might have looked at me, but that wasn't my sort of thing. Um, so for about a year or two, it goes really, really big. And there's like hundreds of thousands every, and so you add up, that's like a millions every year, like 10, 15 million each year. Uh, but then there's a slight change comes about, uh, cause up to then we've had surveillance on us and it's kind of a little bit like a game cause it's uh, oh, there's a car there. That's probably them, you know? And initially I think when you get surveillance on you, you're supposed to break your pattern. And he's like, no, you carry on as normal. The point is they watch, they find the thing, they have to move off cause They've only got certain budgets. They're going to stay on you like six, eight weeks. So that's all you do is wait them out, really. Except then someone goes over a speed bump and a tracker drops off. And you think, oh, fuck, they're coming a bit closer. That's not, that's not good, is it? Um, so we start worrying about trackers. We're having to just constantly check the vehicles. He's always got one mechanic does all the vehicles because you don't take it out to outsiders because they end up putting trackers on your cars. But obviously, if someone's put a tracker on a car, they've got to the car, it's the chance that they've got into the compound, in which case they might be in the caravans. There might be bugs in the caravans and stuff because that's... I used to use caravans as offices. Because if one was ever bugged, you just get rid of the caravan and put a new one in. It was quite a flexible system. Um, but once you, you start seeing the trackers and you think, oh, great, this isn't, this isn't good. And then we're having to watch caravans we're talking in because we think we're bugged. And then one day in, in the January, it changes a little bit. There's a, there's a power cut. Well, this time he's living in this muse. It's kind of like a, he's got gates, he's got, uh, he's got dogs, he's got cameras, like a, you know, like Al Pacino is a bit, it's a bit like that, but kind of a, a commentary version. Um, and there's a power cut and two guys from next door, they just moved in. They come around, knock the gates, you know, you've got any candles, the fucking the electric's gone and all that. Oh, I, you know, the kind of blokey guys sort of, you know. So he, he kind of lets them in, does them a cup of tea and everything, is what, what his partner does. And they chat for a while because there's no electric, nothing can go on. And they end up talking. These guys, one of them's out on licence. They're real dodgy people from Birmingham. Um, you know, you know, maybe we can do some stuff together. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. You know, and then the golf electric comes off, they go off back and, you know, mates, apparently. But as soon as they leave, my dad says, fucking undercovers, isn't they? With, you know, just matter of fact, he knows they're undercover. And I find out a few days later, and at that point, I think, for fuck's sake, really, this is the time we need to break the pattern and just, you know, not just pack up, but just, just move off, just change everything. But he's like, no, well, you know, we'll just wait him out. We're kind of... He knew the landlord next door. No, I'll get him evicted. I'll get him shifted. And that was his attitude to it. And my attitude at the time was, no, things are going great for me now. I've got my money. I've got my missus. We just booked two um, tickets for Thailand two months away. So I've got two months with these undercover officers. Uh, they're going to be about. And we've got all these, like I said, the occasional car and that sort of thing. But I do get the feeling I'm never going to make it to this trip to Thailand. Um, at this time, he's got a place on Paul Road. It's a massive container unit. And that's his base. And it's kind of a lot of chaos there. There's all these container units. All the rogues in an eating are hiring units. You know, they just go and store all their stolen fags and jacket, whatever they're, what they're dealing with. 
and my dad's got three caravans and they're his offices. He'd always have a clean office and he wasn't bugged and that's where he'd work from. And the other two may be bugged. That one's just dirt, keep out of that, just use it for storage. Uh, but then one day, these two undercover guys come, you know, hire a container unit. So all of a sudden they start coming every day. And you think, fuck, they're getting really close here. And then one day a helicopter goes over and they're kind of checking out, you know, the, the area because they want to see what your exit points are. They're going to come in for a raid. What's going to happen? And they're getting really close. And I've got these tickets for Thailand. And I'm, th I'm, I'm just keeping my car away from the place, trying to stay off the surveillance. There's cameras from the place opposite. And my dad said, don't worry, I'll sort it. And he just puts some containers on top of each other to block the view of the cameras. Uh, but they're getting really close. It's getting a bit claustrophobic. But the expectation is on to carry on working because you can't wuss out what it's like. You know, there's a group here, you've been working together for so long, you can't really say, well, you know, I think I'll, I'll leave you to it sort of thing. It's a bit cowardly. So you've got to stick with it, but you can just reduce your workload and what you're doing. And slowly I do that. And then eventually, well, the day before I, I kind of get off to Thailand, I just, I just say to him, look, you've, you've got to just say to these guys, look, we know who you are. Can you just fuck off and leave us alone? Because it's, it's just getting, getting so close now. And he said, no, you know, worries. I've got it all. He's always got it all sorted. So I head off to Thailand. So only when the flight goes off, I'm confident I'm going. Because up to that point, I'm, I'm expecting, you know, like you think you're going and a couple of officers come on. You think, shit. Um, but I, I go and I think, wow, I'm fucking away now. And then three weeks later, I've got an inkling. I phone home, you know, what's happening? What's happening? Mum goes, like, oh, they've all been arrested. She said, all of them, your brother, everybody. It's all been over the papers. Your dad sees he's in prison at the minute. And I think, shit. Uh, and she says, oh, he said, your brother, they, they got your brother, they got him here. The police have come for you. And when they came, you know, you weren't here. So your brother walked in at that moment, they arrested him. They said, you want to listen as well? So they're all, it, it's really was felt. And I'm in Thailand and I'm thinking, well, I'm, I ain't going home. I'm staying here. I'm like, uh, we check out the hotel. We move into my wife's village. Uh, and I thought I'm going to be a farmer. I'm going to stay here until this passes. If it takes a year or two, I'm stopping here. I ain't going anywhere. Uh, so that initially that's what I do, but I start phoning home to get an idea of what's going on, get the, the period the surveillance was on and what's part of the case. And I think, okay, I'm only there for three weeks of that because the other three weeks I'm in a different country at the most critical bit. And it's during those three weeks where it all kind of kicks off and it later works out. My dad was playing this freaking cat and mouse. He knew they were officers and they kept trying to sell him stuff and he kept toying with them, knowing, you know, frustrating them. It was almost like a hobby he had. It's like he's going to fuck off these officers by just... Yeah, maybe I can, maybe I can't. And Do you think that was your dad's downfall, though? But he's a very intelligent man, but again, too risky because he's so much anti-authority where, like you knew, yeah. you, you feel it. I mean, the coppers are watching you if they're bugging you, if you've got surveillance, you just know you've got a sense. Yeah. You've got a feeling that somebody's, he somebody's like that. there. Yeah, I, I, he really liked the frustration. Do you think that was his downfall, though? He got a buzz out of try it. Any rational person was like, no. Yeah, because you try and play games, you only make one mistake, you're done. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And that's all it takes, like, sometimes people can think they're a bit too clever yeah i think that was kind of his thing it was it was his battle of wits and i think some of it was it done a lot of time and it's like you know i fucking i should have beat you before and this time i've really got you on the hook i'm just going to play with you and that's what he seemed to be do it was like the one towards the end they they did give references you know the the, the informants give references uh there were shit references because i remember i was there when they were doing the references uh one of the guy wouldn't he'd gone offside he, he couldn't back it up and the other guy was so hesitant it was clear they weren't happy with these they're putting these officers forward and then later after i'd gone he, he, he was doing a deal with them i forgot what it was over i think they were trying to send him a pill machine and he was like okay then and he got a new caravan from me and he said right we're going there and he did the body search on each of them you get to the point where you're doing body searches that thorough and it turned out one had a bug in the heel of his shoe. So they still got in, but they didn't catch him on saying anything. But that's how silly it was really getting towards the end, where he's just, you know, I know that you know. And mm -hmm. and in the end, uh, he sets up a phony cigarette deal. When he's on the phone, he's on about, he's got a shipment coming in. And it's not a shipment at all. It's a bit of a, there's a bit of a squiz and all the helicopters and everything, they all came in and got him that way. And it turned out it was to do with cigarettes that were stored in the container unit next door. Um, which would get him off it later. So I come back from Thailand after a short while anyway, probably a few months. I've got the all clear. And at that point, I changed my name to Wilson anyway. Because I've saw this coming and I think I've changed it by depot. Originally, I'm Shipley like my dad. Uh, he was originally Shipley and he changed it to Spencer. This time I change it to Wilson. Uh, and I'm going to start afresh. I'm not going to do the animation. I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, but I do go visit him after all. Once it's clear, and I'm sure I'm not part of this conspiracy, 
I'm going to visit him. He's down at Woodhill. He's a double A cat because um, so he's an escape risk. And when he's been to court, there's all up no armed police on the bridges and all that. But really over the top. But he's double A cat. And you have to go see him in double A cat. You've got the freaking lip readers and stuff. So you're having to talk behind your hands like this and uh, trying to say, what the fuck did you do? You're not listening to me. That last day when we sat in the car and I told you, you didn't listen, did you? And he's, he's like, well, it's all done now. You know, look forward and everything. We've got this case and we've got to beat it. Uh, so for the next 20 months, he's on remand. Uh, five, last four or five months as a court case. Um, do everything we can to help him during that period. Uh, lots of problems on the outside. My brother feels the brunt of it. Uh, it's like when when he was on remand, because when you go down, you get caught. The people you owe money think, oh, fucking great, this is, I ain't going to have to pay him, you know. But the people, now the people who you're owing money, they start screaming. They really want their money. And there's a, they figure there's a queue. So that was all on my brother. He got all the harassment, all the phone calls. And then at Woodhill, he was picked up outside. They took him for a drive with a gun on his kneecaps just to just to scare him. And my dad was like, yeah, well, they've scared you, but, you know, it's nothing to worry about. And he was, he was like that with anything. You know, nothing to worry about. I'll take care of it. I'll have a word. And that's what he did. But, yeah, there's a lot of shit there, but I missed quite a bit of it. Um, but then a year later, we've kind of at uh, Birmingham Court, and it's kind of, like I said, we've got this long trial. We've got great barristers. They're, theirs aren't too great at all. Um, I go to, for some days of the trial, watch it all in, develop. People keep ringing in what's happening. It takes forever, this trial, because it's conspiracy. It's all these little bits, and, mm -hmm. you know, they haven't actually got them doing anything. They've got almost no drugs in the case whatsoever. They've got this code they can't break. It was an obvious code, but they can't break it. There's no evidence that it... So it really rumbles on. And in the end, with the second jury, which are kind of multicultural jury, very working class, he ends up getting a not guilty, which really fucks the police off. Um, in the court, he get, gets out. I mean, I'm one of the few people in the public gallery at the time. He gets out the, gets out the box, all done, shakes the hands of all the jurors and his defence team. And he strides across the court... And there's a Chief Superintendent Blair, those who headed this operation. And he's they spent millions on this. I mean, and my dad holds out his hand to him like it's a... And Blair just looks at him and he just... No, and he just storms out and all the, all the detectives follow him and all the journalists follow him. He's really fucked off. My dad's, my dad's pissed off because he's like, he's lost. He's a sore loser. You know, been fighting this for that long. He's just lost a big game and he's just sore loser. He's really pissed off about that. Um, he always, always would be. I no, no respect for Blair after that. Um, and then we go over to Yates's wine bar... This is kind of significant because what comes later. Um, we go over there, all the jurors, because, you know, like every court's got pubs nearby, all the jurors go over to the, over to Yates's. And we're all talking to them, all the barristers, they disappear because it's all uh, legal ethics and everything. When my dad decides, look, you've kind of saved my life here, or your verdict, that fellow over there, one of you, like juror number nine, he owns an Indian restaurant, well, let's have a party. And he organises this party for all the jurors. And I go with my family and and my brother and all that, and we have this big party. And then a few weeks later, um, Crime Squad have heard about it, and they go around arresting all the jurors. And they think it's been, you know, the jury was nobbled. Right. Yeah. So we kind of, that's a lot of aggravation for a while. And by this time, he's out. And day one, it's kind of, it's kind of, well, I need fresh phones, I need to get working. You know, but I've not been earning for 20 months. Um, and that's what he does, he goes straight back to it. Oh, like Groundhog Day. Um, pretty much exactly the same. You know, start setting up all the bases in the different areas, start getting fresh cars, uh, get fresh workers if you can, get the best of the old ones. Uh, it just starts over. But you're thinking then, you're not thinking, for fuck's sake, man, give it a rest. Like, as much yeah, as you're yeah. still making money, he's still always getting caught. I'm just thinking, you've just got this massive result, because you're yeah. looking at 15, and you've got this massive result, and you're just, like, it's not even like you've waited a few days. You've kind of, the next day, you've got fresh phones on, you're phoning around, you're making big promises on stuff you're going to get in. Uh, you're trying to get your passport back. Um, you just want everything. And he's like, well, everything's gone to rack and ruins. I've got to get work and I've got everything back together. I've got to get earning. And it's, he treats it like it's his job. It's his role. You know, this is what he's got to do. I said, go straight back to it. Uh, by this, this point, I've not earned for 20 months. So very little art, art, artwork come in. So I start driving for him again. And it really is like Groundhog Day because I think, oh, this is... And quite quickly, he gets some surveillance on him. Uh, and at that point, I just pull away. I think, no, this, this isn't for me. This is, uh, this is just going one way again already. I can see it already. So I back off. He carries on. He rebuilds everything. Um, my daughter's born about that sort of time. That's one of the reasons I backed off. I thought I'm going to be a father myself. 
I don't want it like when I was a kid and my dad's, imp- you know, mm-hmm. I want it, where it's all right for her and everything. So he, he just rebuilds everything. He spends about a million quid within about six months on, you know, infrastructure. He's got all these boats back and everything. He used to use the canal boats and all that sort of thing. And he's got all these premises, overspends on everything. And he's way too generous. And he's got stacks of workers again. And they're bringing stuff in and now they're about to go up the scale because everything's paid for and now it's a pure profit. Uh, and then they're working on the canal boats and one of the workers spots a surveillance camera in a tree, real small one, like really advanced for the time. And instead of leaving it, which is what you're supposed to do, and just report it, you know, they're there, you don't want to, uh, the, the worker pulls it down and immediately it tells the police, well, we know there's an operation on, uh, which means they're coming very soon, like within 24 hours, going to be raids. He phones me up and he says, you need to have a clear out, get everything out. And I'm like, what do you mean clear out? I ain't been doing anything. This one's nothing to do with me. Uh, but he says, no, he says, they're coming, so I'm going to be off soon. Uh, but he doesn't quite make it. Next day, he gets arrested. He hasn't quite cleared everything. He ends up back at Woodhill all over again. It really is just the same. He's back at Woodhill, same visits. But in this instance, he spots on, you know, they arrest you. They, he's, they've remanded him for 60 days, but they made a mistake because they missed a bank holiday out. So there's one day they've missed. And on that one day, he goes in with his lawyers and puts bail up and says, I want released. And they release him. And then he's released. Um, gets 24 hours surveillance on him because they were they made a big big mistake uh, i see him the last few times i drive him for a few days here and there always got a police car behind us uh, going around just tying up the loose ends and then one day he just disappears uh, he goes up north starts working with the people up north um but the police are everywhere for him at that point and you, you can't i can't really go see him because it's uh he's on the run they're on every they're on everybody yeah surveillance and everybody in case you mm. go to him yeah, it's kind of very intense, that is. Mm-hmm. And also, it's a bit like the plates. He takes the camera and the communicates with the lawyers, uh, but he won't give the camera back. And it's uh, this advanced thing they really want back. Uh, it's a bit like the thing in the wire. You see that wire series where they knit the camera yeah. desperately. It's a bit like that. They desperately want this camera back and he won't give it on. It's, but it's that thing where he's got that thing with him that goes way back, where if he can piss them off, he will, because he thinks that's that's the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um so, he, yeah, he goes up north and then he disappears. He goes off to Amsterdam after that. He's, he works with a group up there, becomes part of that group for a while, and then goes to Amsterdam. And then he sets up under a new name over there called English John. Uh, wherever he went, he always had different names. It was always John, Pat, Steve. Always change the names. Whenever there was a police raid somewhere, everyone's got to change their names. You've got to change your phones, change your names, and all that sort of stuff. And he go, John, Pat, and now I'm this, and then I'm Steve. And I think, you're not a freaking Steve. It's some, some names suit and some don't. And at that point... A lot of the work, you start calling him the old man because he was a bit older than the rest of us. He's in his 40s, early 50s by that point. And it was an easy way of just having a vague nickname for him without him to keep chopping names all the time. Um, so that's how we called him the old man up because he was old. It was just because of that. Uh, but he ends up in Amsterdam and over there he's known as English John. And he has all the Dutch mafia and all the Dutch bikers and all over there. And he's doing the supply end over that way. Um, and then gradually I start seeing him again. I go over, uh, take his ex's money over. Um, and then one day I'll go and he's got this, he's got to meet with these real plastic gangsters they are. It's all, you know, they've got the fancy cars and they've got, they've got real henchmen, like real massive people. And it's really obvious what they are. And it's because they, they, they want to supply coke. And my dad doesn't want to get involved in that. He's never dealt with heroin and he didn't want to deal in coke either. Why? Heroin, he said, he saw it with, you know, the guys inside taking it. He said, absolutely destructive. He said, wouldn't, wouldn't have anything to do with heroin at all. Uh, everyone I've known who've said that about, they said, yeah, couldn't get, he could, you know, the ones who did deal with it, couldn't get him to deal with it, he wouldn't deal with it. But he was reluctant to deal with coke as well because he thought the risk was high. You know, when you have a coke operation, the budgets for those, because it's cat A, they, they go on longer, the more intense. And if you get caught, you get like 20 years. Whereas if you're doing it with hash, it will, you know, uh, amphetamine. Was that B at the time? Was it not a class B? Uh, what, the coke? Hash, I think. Oh, the hash. Yeah. That's always been an A, but... Well, well the, ho- the hash, it varied. You know, when Blair come in, yeah. you had the cigarettes. At one point, it was just as risky to do cigarettes as it was to do hash. Yeah. Because yeah, they, they played around with it, cat C and that sort mm-hmm. of thing. Um, but the coke, he felt the same on the coke. He just thought, no, the police operations are too big when they're going for coke. He said, they don't stay on you for six to eight weeks. They just stay on you. Totally catch you. Yeah. Yeah, it says it's not worth the risk. So we were over there and he, he had this meet with them. And we went to this big bloody building. And he, before I go there, he said, look, I don't like the look of this. Just get offside. So if there's any sort of bugs on, you, you're not party to anything. I went into there and there's a big, massive one room, just one big, massive room. And I was, all I can do is go to the far corner and they're at the boardroom at the other end. 
and they're talking and they, these Dutch are using the real names. They're saying, so Tony, you know, when can you get us some Coke and all this sort of thing? And the word Coke is just bouncing around the room. And I'm like, Christ, this is really bad. You've got these, you've got these massive guys on the door. You know, they look like they've got guns. They may not, but it's just very, very plastic. It's not, after we leave it, it's quite fuming. And at that point, when we leave, he gets a phone call. And it's a guy um, from up north called David Royal. Uh, he's a drug dealer. Uh, and a few months ago, he'd stole about 240 grand uh, from Portsmouth. There was a handover at Portsmouth. He'd sold that. He stole that. And my dad had been told, telling him, you know, you're going to have to give it back because you're going to have real problems. You don't give me that money back. Uh, and he was phoning up to say, look, I've got your money. I'm in Amsterdam. I'm going to give you money back now. And that opened up this other episode to follow. Oh. Yeah, well, people will get shot. Mm. Your dad gets shot as well. Yeah, you? yeah. That's how that come about. Uh, init initially, when this money was to go abroad, I was meant to be taking it. But I got a substitute at the last minute by an Irish fellow, which was fortunate. He got robbed at uh, gunpoint, and uh, that's how we, this royal got the money. Um, but once he knew my dad was, uh, he, and he knew it was to do with like the Irish, he had to face up to the fact if you either hand it back or you're going to get wiped out, essentially, because we'll come after all of you. So he looked, looked and he said, look, I'm going to give you the money back. He said, I've spent 30 grand of it, but the 100 night. My dad said, no, have the 30. I don't care about that. Just give us the money back. Uh, so they, they're going to arrange this me. I go back to the UK. Before he goes, I've warned him. I said, look, this don't sound right. He's been making these promises for weeks now. Are you sure this is? And he said, no worries. You know, he's not going to mess me about. He's very confident. And like I said, he's always confident. And then it's, um, I think it's like the Friday or Saturday, Saturday morning, I think it was. I get a phone call off him. And for the first time, his voice is very faint. And it's like, you know, I've been in an accident and, yeah, I'm in a bit of a bad way. Can you get over? And immediately, I think it's to do with these guys who've been doing this coke thing. Maybe something's gone wrong there because he's pissed them off by refusing to deal with them. Um, so I said, yeah, OK. And he asked me to bring two other people over. So I head over to Amsterdam, uh, go to the safe house on the north side on, in I plane, uh, and then knock the door. And the guy called Sowerby answers, so the next lifer. He's there. He's one of my dad's workers, there, a reliable guy. And he says, look, your, dad, your dad's been shot. He's been shot in the chest. Um, he says, in a bad way, we don't know if he's going to pull through. Um, so and then we just walk into the room. It's all dark, and he's just lying there on a, like a stretcher bed, uh, a few bandages and that. Uh, and then he kind of starts to come round, and he says, you all right there, and, you know, how was the drive? <laughs> he said, you check for trackers on your car. You know, you left your phone. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I left all the phones. I've done all the usual stuff. And he's like, yeah, yeah, he had a bit of a problem. <laughs> he's really understated as always. And I, I was just kind of wordless. His girlfriend's there and she's like, she's pretty, she's only been with him for a few years and the stuff that's happened within a few years. Um, I'm like, Christ, what's, so I go and speak to Sue. He explained everything that happened, how it had all gone wrong. He gone, it met this guy, Royal, drove down to the docks and Royal had his two of his guys there, you know, looking masks and handguns. And they kind of tried to get my dad out of the car. But my dad had a little nine millimeter with him. And as he come from the car, he kind of pulled it, started to pull it out. And the guy who had the gun on him on his, you know, at his chest at that point, he just panicked and shot. And he just kind of shot him back. And um, I mean, a film, usually you kind of go down, you think you're shot, but he didn't. He just kind of steadied himself, then he pulling his gun out and then just started firing. Um, There's three guys, one went down, one ran for it. And Royal, who was the, in the passenger at the, at the time, he comes around the car. I mean, I just sees him and he just raises a gun and just shoots him in the chest. Uh, Royal goes down and within a couple of minutes he's dead. Um, and at that point, my dad just leans on the on the bonnet of the car, leaves a massive, you know, palm print and just collects himself, tries to figure out where the hell they're going now. He's, he's been, I don't, I'm not sure how much pain he's feeling, but he's just real, real hit. And he just works out where the nearest safe house is, which turns out a Dutch bar where he first worked there when he went to Amsterdam, the mafia, you know, the Dutch mafia were in control of it, and he heads for there. And they kind of get a vet out to him, get him checked over later, we'll get a doctor from Switzerland. But by the time I get there, it's just, you're gonna have to wait and see if have got 24 hours, we're gonna see if he's gonna pull through or not. So he's got all these, he's high on all these tablets, but he starts taking them when I get there. Uh, and we just have this quiet evening, no phones, because you know, all the phones have been all been dumped. And we just got 24 hours to see if he's gonna pull through or not. Uh, and he lies on the stretcher bed, stops taking his meds, and then starts telling us the story about what happened at the docks. And it's, good, it's a good storyteller. He kind of tells it very, very dramatic. And the room's all dark, and there's just one lamp on. And it's, uh, 
he tells a story, and I kind of put that in the first chapter of the book. It's pretty much as he explained it, all in fine detail, and how he got into the car and he could smell it was a, you know, it was a new car because he could just smell that it's a rental. And if you up to something, you use a rental sometimes. And then the guy, he didn't, he didn't know where everything was on the car. He was really confused. Couldn't read the signs in the centre of the house. It was just, yeah. So we could, I kind of, like I said, first chapter was just my dad yeah. talking. That's so what he's the guy Royal stole the, yeah, the money from your dad. Mm. Had the meeting from your with your dad, mm. and then they try to kill your dad. Yeah, it's just straightforward. So it's self defence. Uh, pretty, ju it's justifiable. But the fact is, he didn't even hesitate. He just kind of, you're dead, sort of thing. But your dad's still on the run from the UK. Yeah, still He's on the been yeah. shot and then killed a the guy. Like, what yeah. happens there then? Um, well, by the following morning, he started to put. He's got through the worst of it, and all through that night, I'm thinking, fuck. Um, that's private doctors, isn't it? Yeah, it's just there that Dutch bring these doctors in. You can't go to hospital because like, he's on the run and it's a gunshot wound and it's, there's just problem after problem there. Um, so, so the following day, he starts to pull through and he starts to, he's sitting up and he, start, he needs a shave and he starts getting ready. And I think, well, you know, you just, you know, been shot. And it's like, no, I've got, we've got to, got to see people. I need people to start coming around because if people think I'm shot and I'm gone, then all shit's going to, you know, because... Uh, people who owed money, people expecting stuff, there's going to be problems if, I, if they can't see I'm okay. So all these Dutch people start coming around and he starts, so, you know, finishing these deals. But he's not standing up, he's lying on a stretcher bed still. And they all come in and a few, a few of them are armed, I'm told. I didn't, I didn't notice, BT told me a few weeks back. And there's all real serious, heavy Dutch people coming. They're all coming up to sell up these deals for supplies and everything. And that's what they do all day. And at that point, it's one of those days where I just think there's something not right here. This is freaking... I've only been back with him like four or five years since he's been out and just so much has happened and it just doesn't seem to learn from anything. It's just relentless. There's never a point, like you said, when he, even after the day he got the not guilty, he didn't even chill out. It's just, and this is the same thing. Day after the shoot, he's not even chilling out. It's like, no, I've got to get things moving. I've got to get fresh phones and then we'll, we'll get down to Spain and then everything will be all right then. And that's sure enough, that's what eventually happens. He, he goes down to Spain, I'll come back to the UK and uh, things just start over in Spain again. <laughs> just just straight back to it just no break a sad yeah. existence as well isn't it when you're spending 10 years here 11 years here that remand for two years even that a remand yeah. for two years is a five year stretch yeah you look at it, but I mean the remand for 20 months you, didn't, you don't even get compensation yeah. there's just no pluses on it really apart yeah. from you've had a victory over them it's just the buzz it's just a constant chase the constant buzz try to get one over the authorities that when you've got kids as well that it's sad that people get so caught up in that life and try to beat the system because when it all when you boil it all down, nobody ever beats that. I don't think they ever, I think they get satisfaction in this in the victories because mm -hmm. you get caught for like the one percent, don't you? Just games. Yeah, the ninety nine percent. You've mm -hmm. got that set when you sit in yourself. I got away with all that. Mm -hmm. and I made all that, and they never touched me. It's just that fucker at the end that got me. Yeah. But I'm going to learn from that, and that's what it, it'd always be like. That mm -hmm. he'd always just learn and come back better. So he ends up back in a place called Casa de Fels near Barcelona. Again, I start going out there and you know drop his ex's money and stuff. Uh, and he starts mostly dealing in the hash at that point. But things are changing in the market because people start home growing over here and all of a sudden the quality of the hash, there's problems with that. Prices drop. Yes, yeah, so the market's slowly changing. He's a bit slow on to kind of go with that because the inevitable move is to move to something else. And what do you move to? Well, it'd be Coke, which I don't think at the time he wanted to move to. So for a while he does these smuggling thing. He buys a, he buys a bloody ship out there for a quarter of a million pound. Um, but there's problems with that, um, with the Spanish guy who sold it to him. That creates all sorts of problems. Um, and then after that, they're doing rib boats across the Med. Um, so and then rib boats down at Gibraltar. There's just a lot going on. Uh, but then one day, um, we, we asked, one day we go to Madrid. This is the, the kind of the break point for me. We go to Madrid. And by this point, it's been on the, on the run for about three years. There are all sorts of problems. Quite a few debts, actually, because... When, you, when you're a villain on the run, you're easy to rob and you're easy not to pay. You know, so there's all these other problems with the villains, a lot of politics there. Um, so we go to Madrid one day to meet a guy called the Chinaman who wants to invest and he wants to invest in the new coke from South America. And I'm very aware my dad's got these South American contacts, like, you know, Venezuela and Colombia. And it sounds like that's where that's why he's not worried about the hash in it because he's, he's moving on. And at that point, it, I kind of, no, I'm not doing this. This is not for me. So I kind of break off of it. We don't fall out. But he understands, I don't, I don't go with this at all. I'm not going to be like party to that. Um, so I stopped going over so much. I still take his messages and do stuff, but not. I kind of, we kind of go see things differently. And he's all right with that. Um, 
But then some months later, don't hear of him for a few days, people phoning him, where the hell's your dad? We've not heard of him. And then I get a letter coming through and he's at a prison down in uh, Al Horan, you know, Malaga. Uh, been arrested with three tonne of cash. Um, so he's under there in a false name called Graham Penny, which is the name he was using while he was on the run. And he's looking at, he's looking at, I think, seven years there. There's five of them. Um, so he's got problems with that, Graham Penny. There's a guy on the outside trying to get him bail to get him out. Uh, they eventually get bail, and all of them are going to be released, except at the gates as they're being released. My dad gets called back and says, hold on a minute. He's not allowed out the final gate. He says, you're kind of wanted for extradition. You're, you're Tony Spencer? He says, you wanted for extradition to Holland, you know, for murder. And so he's pulled back. He's the only one who's kept there. A few months later, he gets seven years for the hash. All the others have absconded on bail. That's the deal in Spain. You don't go back if you've, you know, it's kind of unsaid rule sort of thing. But he gets seven years, he gets sent to Valdemoro, and then they want him in Holland for this murder of David Royal, uh, which is, is going to be, I suppose it's going to be a problem, though he completes self defence. And then I did that. There's another killing as well that comes up and he gets accused with that. It's real, gets real complicated. Um, so for, at that point, I kind of evaluate, he's kind of, He's wanted in England for the conspiracy. He's wanted in Holland for the murder, questioned about another murder. And he's got seven years in Spain. It looks about as bad as it could possibly be. And at that point, not a lot of people are really going to help because they're like, commodity-wise, as a villain, if you're about to come out, your price goes up. But if you're looking at life, no one's going to help you out, really. You've got a few old school mates who might, if you can find them. But that's, that's where he's stuck. And at that point, I try and do everything I can. Start raising his legal fees, trying to get a trying to help with his appeal and that sort of thing. Um, just doing my best by him, really, because at that point, it's like, I'm probably the last worker in the UK, all the other people are over in Spain and that. Um, so it's kind of just me and him at that point. Um, so we start kind of working on that. The, one of the murder charges gets dropped in Holland, it gets switched onto somebody else who later gets found guilty. Um, he has to go to Holland in the end. So that's where he goes, it goes there, gets extradited. Um, he has a trial. By then, we know all the evidence, all the forensics. We've got hold of all of them. And he just adapts his evidence to that to say it was self-defense. Explains he grabbed the gun off Royal and he shot him with his gun. He was his mate and everything. Uh, gets accepted, gets not guilty. And all of a sudden, his price goes up a little bit. He's just got to get back to Spain and finish his sentence. Um, and so during that period, our relationship starts to change a little bit. Why? Um, when he goes to Holland, he cuts off contact with everybody because the Dutch are so sharp on surveillance. All the, everything will be recorded, all the letters. So he cuts off contact. And once he gets this not guilty, there's no crime agenda for us to discuss anymore. Because uh, I'm not going to be really part of that. So we start writing about other stuff. And I'm kind of in my 30s then. I need to start doing something. I can't, can't be driving for him and doing stuff with him all these years. Um, and I've got no... I've, I can't go back to art. That's kind of... It's all been replaced by computers. So I start studying psychology and I do a bit of art in French and stuff. He's, he's studying languages at this time because he's doing all the law stuff. So he's still studying German and Dutch and still doing his Spanish. Uh, so we start studying, talking about languages and all this sort of stuff and a bit of psychology. And then I send him some drawings about a project I want to do um, to do with um, sm drug smuggling, ironically. It's uh, going to be a comic book is the idea. And he surprises me because he's quite okay with this. He's like, yeah, yeah, that'd be fucking good. That would, you know. So we start corresponding over this last year of his sentence in Spain, you know, between Holland and Spain. We start corresponding. It's just like a father-son thing. We've got this project we're going to do. Uh, but our relationship's really good. It's not to do with crime anymore. It's just this. But crime's bubbling away in the background. He's still sending me all these contacts that's accumulating. A lot of them South American, a lot of them Spanish. Um, and then eventually we get to the point where he's finished his sentence and he's going to get released. It's just whether he's going to get arrested when he gets back here for this conspiracy. Um, they're going to put him on a flight and uh, I go down to Heathrow and wait for him to come through. He's delayed. He doesn't come through straight away. Uh, turns out they've kind of given him a lot of hassle coming in. He doesn't get charged or anything, but they just want to let him know, you know, welcome home, Mr. Spencer and all that sort of stuff. And then uh, there's also the thing, he's had some medical problems. You know, this gun, gun bullet that's gone in. It's a dum dum bullet. It's all these little fragments around his lungs. They keep getting infected. So he's had to go to civilian hospitals a few times. It's got that bad. So by the time he's coming through, I think he's going to be a bit of a state because of all this medical stuff that's been going on as well. But he comes through customs when he eventually does. He's as fit as a fiddle. He's got a beautiful tan. He's been on a med diet for the last five or six years. Looks great. Um, and he's as confident, same old smile, you know, happy go lucky as always. Uh, dark sense of humor. 
and we go back to the car, get in the car, and he says, you got, you got me a new fresh phone? I said, yeah, it's in the dash. He sets up his phone, starts making some calls. People start phoning my phone, and immediately he's like, by the time we get to the M1, he's setting up his first meeting. It's like, yeah, we back up late. We'll have a quick word, and there's a lot to get on with, and he's going to get back to it. Just casual as you like. How good does a survive the dum dum bullet? Is that not when it hits you, it just starts ricocheting like a pinball machine inside your body? Well, some of it came out through the back. And some of it sprayed, some fragments got caught on the lungs. It just missed the vital organs as it went mm -hmm. through. So a lot of it did get through, but it's all these bits that stayed in. Um, so there was the argument for getting out for a long time, but when he knew he was going to go to Holland, if you take the evidence out, you're going to have a problem when you get to Holland, so you have to keep it in him. So one of the things when he went to Holland, then they did the x-rays, they could see it inside. And so when he said, look, I've been shot in the fucking chest by this, it kind of matched all the forensics. So the, 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 the fragments actually got him off in Holland. They made it quite clear it was self-defense because once they know he's been shot in the chest, they'd heard he'd been shot, but they didn't know where it could have been the leg or anything. But once they knew it was there, it was clearly self-defense. Did they not get done for like, not reporting the crime or like, leaving, the, leaving the scene? No, he would have been crazed. You know, the adrenaline and everything, yeah. it was just be. And he was on the run from Britain. They, they, the thing is, when he went on trial for that, they didn't care that he was a drug dealer because the Dutch were like, all that drug stuff, we don't care about that. What we care about is just this one incident we don't care if you're Pablo Escobar. The main thing is this shooting. That's all we're interested in. And that's the way they kind of see it. They're kind of a mature way of looking at it, I guess. Mm -hmm. So we had no other problems in Holland. So he's got out again, straight back out, left the airport, and he's straight back to what? Straight back. Originally, I thought he can come back, stay at ours. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you see this ain't going to work. Yeah. But that's my naive. I thought, you know, may maybe he's going to knock this all on the head. But when he's in the car, he's doing his calls. But he's going to stay at mine until he's kind of got sorted. Did you ever have that conversation with him to say, look, Dad, what the fuck are you doing? Like, it's, like, it's just the same. It's not, not, you, like you say from a kid, nothing ever changed. Prison, back out, straight to work. Prison, back out, straight to work. Yeah. Even getting older, and then you're getting shot, and then there's dead bodies, and then you're talking about doing coke. Like, everything's becoming more extreme. Like, where does Is it, it end? I guess if you've, if you've done so many years, if you go straight, then you did those years for nothing. I think he kind of thought it justified the future. It was this, mm -hmm. I think I've heard you mention this, calm, calm, it's kind of it's a natural justice at work. You've done all this time for a reason. You know, you did all those years for a reason. It was to get better at what you do and to become smarter and then great rewards will lie ahead. It's always that faith in the future. My dad never looked back that much. And if you questioned him, he had an answer for everything. He was just very, he's very good at rationalising and overwhelming you with logic. Yeah. So you think, for fuck's sake. And he was always like one of those people used to defer to him quite a lot because he was so expert on all these little areas and everything. So you felt like he's not going to listen. Um, so you drop hints and try and steer him. For a while, I did think I could steer him away, you know, these comic books and get some TV work, some media work. But he wasn't interested. But the day he come back, the following morning, um, I went up the shops, came back. And when I come back, he was at the door. He's just a fucking leaflet here from some gardening people. And he showed me it and he was like, yeah, I think they're undercover police. So I found the number and it's a dead number. Check the neighbours, none of them have had it. They are fuck. So my address is a bit, they're already on my address. We got up the high street to get a load of him kitted out with stuff. And whilst we were up there, he's like, yeah, bloke behind me over the road, white shirt. Look over, there's a guy there just lingering. And we walk up the road, there's a woman in the entrance to one of the shops up the road. He points her out, sees her straight away. And as we walk down, he's clocked them and they realise he's clocked them and they're just, yeah, smart, yeah, you know, we don't, we're just letting you know we're here. Uh, so within hours he's left, he goes off. My my idea that I would kind of, kind of um, get him onto a normal path would just, it just kind of, it was a waste of time really. What did you do then? Uh, immediately he went to work. I, I started working on this comic book thing. There was no money in it initially. But I thought, I'm going to carry on. We've been doing it for a year or so while he was at Valdemoro Prison and in Holland. So I carry on doing that. And a year later, that gets published. Um, and by that point, my dad's, he's, he's done a, a, quite a few frauds. He's done, you know, like bank fraud. He's done a bit of that. He's bought some parcels in. Um, so he's done a bit of that. And, but then he joins me for these book signings when we start to get in the newspapers. Um, there's a bit of controversy. An MP wants the book banned. He finds out there's a... There's a fellow from Cov called Mick McGlinch who's kind of smuggling them into Winston Green and getting them sent in. The MPs aren't happy and the prison's not happy and it gets in this two pages in the Mercury. Um, so it's great for the book, but it's um, it gets my dad a lot of attention. A lot of the people he's working with don't really like it too much. It's like, you know, you can't, he's high profile enough as it is without him being in newspapers. 
So a few of them weren't too happy about it. Um, but me and him, we were, we were never been better in that respect. I kind of ignored the crime stuff that was going on a fair bit. He had a lot of people around him at that time because a lot of people were waiting for him to come back. Uh, he'd been away all those years and while he'd been away they hadn't made that much money and now he was back it was like oh, you know Tony you've got all these suppliers you know all these contacts and things are going like the good old days you know it's kind of like that mm -hmm. but me and him it was mostly we did the comic books together and I'd carry on with that you know legal straight work and I'd go see him on the Sunday morning we'd go through what had been happening in the papers that week and what was going on with the new book and then his people would start arriving and I'd be like well I'm going to shoot off then uh, and he'd be like, no, stick around and see what's going on and everything. And I'd be like, no, I'd, I'd leave, give it a miss. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then one week I'd go and there's a surveillance camera on the tree outside. And he's just like, watch out for the camera. And it's like the old days again. And you think this is going back in the same direction all over again. And it turns out that's what's happening. But it's a lot bigger scale than he thought and I thought. Because um, at that point, all the, the police squads are kind of working together. It's national. It's soccer that time. And they're liaising with the Dutch. And... Uh, and also my dad at that point is way impatient by that point because he's kind of, uh, in the old days, he drove everywhere. He never took flights anywhere. And now he's taking flights. So he just hasn't got the patience for it. Um, and there's about 10 people involved. And it's, that's too many people. You know, you've got to keep things small and keep them low key and everything. And a lot of them aren't that low key. They're quite enough well known. Virtually all of them have been in prison. You know, they stand out. Uh, they're not blending in. Um, so they start, they've got phone intercepts on all the phones, like 10 of them. Not just one, they've got them on 10 of them. And these are Dutch intercepts as well. So they're kind of watching everything. My dad's still using his codes, but they're not quite as good. It's hopping between Holland and here and everywhere. Um, so th this little group, um, they've, they're, all, they're all savvy with the surveillance. But one day, my dad's over in Holland. He's, he's getting a parcel sorted to come over. Uh, and there's all Dutch police everywhere. Uh, bulldozer comes through the gates. Uh, armed police everywhere. Um, they've seen him coming a few minutes before and they got away from the parcel and everything but he's kind of stuck with it so he's held up in Ho Holland the uh, lawyer rings me up tells me what's happened to the old man uh, and I'm like oh great this is this is the worst one because he's actually caught with it I always thought when he gets caught it's always conspiracy because you'll never catch him with anything but he says no he's been caught with it this time and that's more serious but on the other hand he's in Holland and the sentences in Holland aren't that high so from there, it's a case of all the other in the UK were waiting to see what's happening because he's been caught in Holland. And it, it's technically, it's a, the Dutch have arrested him, not the British. But then over the following six months, there's all this um, trading behind closed doors and the British want him for conspiracy. They're not happy with this being charged in Holland and they do some sort of deal where they'll bring him over here. Um, so the others are all charged with possession in, in Holland, but my dad's pulled out for conspiracy. And when he's pulled over and he's on the flight being extradited, they arrest everybody. Uh, unfortunately they don't arrest me because I'm kind of at that point I've got a few regrets when they find him he's got he's got my books and stuff with him these comic books I did and he's got film contracts and all the, my business cards he's got all this because when they're going to ask him what are you doing in a house full of drugs he's going to say I'm researching this new book I'm doing with my son and that's the answer he's going to give um, so I'm kind of implicated quite a bit and all this stuff in the newspapers doesn't seem so smart now because we're very closely associated um, but fortunately, I, I'm not raided, which is a. I'm up at five o'clock that morning, just waiting, just waiting and hoping. And then I start getting phone calls off partners of people who've been raided. And you think, okay, that's that's four, that's five. And in the end, there's 10 of them all raided, all kind of questioned. Uh, I think in the end, eight of them are remanded to Winston Green. And it's going to be all of them. And at that point, they, they realize that they've all got intercepts on them. Um, and my dad's intercepts, because usually they stop at the borders. These are in Holland and they're in England. Uh, they've, they've got all the surveillance at the airport, surveillance in the streets of Amsterdam, surveillance around Coventry. They've got, they've got everything really. They're really overboard because it's a, it's cat B, cat C, and usually you don't have those resources. And it seems it's kind of a bit of a grudge because they're the years, the one years ago they lost when he got the not guilty. The one after had to get dumped because it wasn't strong enough, and he was on the run so long. And this is kind of payback really. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of facing another trial, uh, Birmingham Court again. Um, it's a bigger court, you have to kind of adjust the court there's that many defendants this time, it's going to be mega scale and of course they're all going to go not guilty despite these intercepts um, even, even one of them even turns on him, he kind of confesses an interview it's that bad, but he comes back on side they all stick together and that's what they do but one, one thing that is there that he's going to, going to negotiate with is uh, this roving bug you know where they activate your cell phones 
uh, the police just with a bit of software. They activate your cell phone and they'll just record what you're saying around the table. They were doing that years like a terrorism technique, which was, um, it was denied at the time they were doing it, but they were doing it all the time. In Holland, it was quite common. Um, and they used that on this case and they were legal. And my dad was like, well, we'll get this thrown out because these intercepts are all illegal. We'll get the case thrown out. That's what they're banking on. And in the case it went ahead, they were going to expose it in open court. And uh, Nick Davis from The Guardian was going to be there reporting it. And it would be going to the national papers. And from there, every case involving international intercepts would be subject to appeal. So that it was some, my dad reasoned, there's no way they're going to allow this to go into court. And then in the final days, uh, we get to court and they decide they, they'll do a deal. Uh, initially, they want 12 but then the barristers argue, no, he's arrested in Holland. You can't, you can't give him that. And they get him down, they get him down to a five. And in the end, they all go for, they all go for guilty and they all get five, fours and threes instead of 12, eights and tens. Mm -hmm. They all get low sentences. Um, but that, that's kind of, at that, at that point, you realise it's just not going to change. It's, like I said, it's that cycle. Who was it for your dad admitting his guilt? Uh, to stand up and say he was guilty first time in life, he'd done that. Um, he, think he'd, he thought he'd got the best deal he was going to get. Um, it was because he, he was caught. It was it was kind of clumsy in that one. It was kind of him at his worst. Do you think that's because he was getting a little older as well? You get you take your foot off the gas. You, you're not as as on the ball like you say, taking flights, flight yeah. logs, everything. Like, it becomes lazy. Yeah, all that kind of. Yeah, I mean, I, I said to him, I said, well, what's, what's all this? You're getting flights and why are you booking them on credit cards? Are actually people with you? You always use pe other people's credit cards. You never use people from in the group. And it was just all this sloppiness. And I was, you know, like I said, when he scored me years ago, he scored me when he was at his best. So years later, and I could I'd ask him about these things. And he was like, well, I'll be off to Spain soon. It doesn't really matter. You know, by the time they come, I'll be gone. They won't be able to touch me. Uh, but the, he just mis underestimated them, overestimated himself. And like I said, he was a bit, too, maybe he was getting older. He just didn't have that patience he once had. What, what happened once he got out from that sentence? Uh, well, a year a year into that sentence, uh, it just when he, you know, this thing with the bullet? Took not well. Yeah, he started to get the scans and all that. And when he eventually got a scan here, they said, you're kind of riddled with cancer. You've got cancer all over your lungs. It's every, you know, uh, and that was a real big thing because it's terminal. And they said, you've basically you're fucked, really. You've got, You've got weeks, you may have months, um, but you've, you know, there's just no, that's it really. So he got out on compassionate grounds. Uh, and then they proposed an operation which might give him a few more months. It's like a real savage one. So he took the operation and kind of really battered him about and everything. He kind of aged 20 years within just a, you know, a day or so. Um, and then he started to, he was, he was at a farmhouse with his girlfriend at the moment, like luxury, luxurious cottage and all this sort of, so she was really well off. And I'd go visit him there. And he was kind of lost, you know, because he was like, for every time I knew him, he was always knew what he was going to do. He always had massive plans. First time in his life, he never had that. You know, there was no phones, nothing was going, he wasn't allowed phones. He was only allowed one phone because of like a court order. Um, but he was just not him, same old self. Uh, but then a few weeks later, I got a phone call saying, look, he's left his partner. He's, he's at your sister's, he's on a caravan on a drive. And I think, oh, great, he's got cancer and he ain't got long to go. He's just had an operation. He's he's moved in with her. So I go up and go up to this caravan and I hear his voice coming outside and it's strong like it used to be. And he steps out and he's kind of just like it used to be. He's no longer looking, you know, he's kind of got some youth back. And he sounds like his old self. He's doing, you know, he's doing some buying and selling and that. Uh, just like he was when he was in his early 20s. A bit of ducking and diving. He's got a few ideas for some parcels for South America. I don't want to know. You know, uh, going on Skype, uh, talking to a fellow called Longair out in Spain. Um, working out transport and everything. But he sounds like his old self. He's got a real buzz about him again. And that's what he'll do for the last few years. He'll just buy and sell, and he'll kind of work on these parcels that are coming in, connect people up, work on all these little... Take less risks, because at the end, I thought he's got cancer. He could do anything now. He's not going to serve any sentence. Um, but he, he doesn't actually get caught in the end. He just goes three or four years, because his cancer special have killed him off. Twelve months later, he wants his passport back. And soccer are objecting because, like, you're supposed to be dead. You're supposed to be dead at Christmas. That was the, you know, that's the deal. Uh, but no, he's, then he starts going to Spain again. <laughs> <laughs> so, and yeah, it's just, it's just, just carries on. And I just phone him, and you know, at that time I'm, I'm studying psychology and I'm working my brother doing building. And every time he found coming over, oh, I'm in Spain, and you know, I'll catch you when I get back, and it's never enough time and that. Um, and near the end, he was like, I think three weeks before he died, he was, he was in a biplane. On, you know, on the med. 
going along the coast trying to locate a cocaine parcel that had been thrown overboard. Uh, I'm still up to all sorts. And then he had some med medical cannabis licenses for Spain because he had his cancer. Get these medical licenses, uh, which we was going to use because uh, you, you could grow it several places in Spain, just kind of duplicate it. And then he'd import cannabis all to the UK was the idea. So everything you do in Spain, because he had the cancer, would be legally sound, he'd be fine. It was only risk when he bought it into the UK. He thought he was going to make a fortune with it. Um, but then the cancer started to come on the last few weeks. Uh, probably the last 10 days, that's when it really knocked him down. But up till then, you, was, he was just slowed a little. That's all he did. He never really, he never really was an invalid. Um, and those final days, it was like, well, he's going to have to wait. I've got Dutch people coming over and some Irish thing I've got to do. And then I've got to see the lawyer in Spain. It was just all this list of things that he had to do. But then the cancer came on strong and it just, it just kind of overwhelmed him in the end. How was your relationship before he passed? It was good before he passed. It Did wasn't... you have any regret with it? What, he or me? Both of you, like, um, for you, him getting you involved in the business and for maybe you not I, trying I, to be I, more I, ruthless and say, look, what the fuck are you doing? Like, it's the same I patterns. gradually kind of accepted him. I had that bit when I was younger. You know, you want him to certain people to be a certain way. Mm -hmm. And I'd learned, you've got to accept him the way he is. It's his character. It's kind of built into him. He can't yeah. change. So it's like when he was, the way I got to spend time with him was by working with him. Because if I, you didn't work with him, you never really heard of him unless he, he wanted something or he wanted to do a bit of deal with you or something. Mm -hmm. And that was just his nature. It was like that with everybody. It was nothing personal. When you're younger, you can take these things personal, but it was the way he was made. And I think all those years inside, if he had a choice, he would have done things differently. He just couldn't do it differently. He, had, he, he liked that buzz and he was kind of addicted to this, this lifestyle. And it wasn't really about the money. It was all just about... Cheers. Yeah, that's what it was about. Because if it was about the money, he would have saved someone and been ruthless with it. Everyone who met him or worked with him also, he was fucking too generous with money. He used to just give too much away and he always treated it like, you know, I've earned it. You might as well just fucking give it, might as well spend it on people, they might as well enjoy it. Do you think a lot of people used your dad? Yeah, yeah, there's certainly, oh. but it's part of, part and parcel of it. They would say, well, we were used, we did stuff for him. Mm -hmm. he, you know, it's kind of a mutual thing. And my dad was quite practical that way. People use each other. It's, it's how you relate to people. You kind of do through projects and doing stuff. Um, but he never took things emotionally very personal. And I don't think he appreciated how hard it was for us sometimes. Because emotionally, sometimes it is difficult, especially yeah. when you're young. Um, I mean, when you look back and you think, well, that, that wasn't particularly nice and it was nasty and unpleasant and everything. Some, some of the years when I was a kid, um, but he never meant any of it. It was just the way he was. He couldn't really, he couldn't really, really be any other way. Uh, how was it when he passed? Like, was that, obviously it's a sad moment, but you knew the day was coming, but we, you, you're never happy that you lose a loved one, but with the life you lived and always in prison, always the surveillance, always living yeah. on. Yeah, it's like walking on eggshells constantly. It's the paranoia enhances as well. That like yeah. you're never on edge. Like you're trying to live a good living, but you still love your dad. That you still want yeah. him in your life. That you can't really enjoy it. But when your dad passed, was there a, you know, what I mean, you're at peace now, dad? Or? The, the, I mean, one thing was he wasn't inside. Mm -hmm. There was a, a friend of his who died inside. He had cancer. He went blind, and they, didn't, they wouldn't release him. Yeah, I'm surprised that they'd release your dad. Yeah. So he did, he did well to get released and he was free because he, he could have been caught out in the bloody med on a boat with loads of cocaine and been mm. South America and died there. But he died a freed man and he had loads of family and friends around him when he went. And he didn't complain. Like all the years inside, he never complained. He never complained about pain. He was just, he never complained about the cancer. He was just, he was just annoyed that it come too quick at the end and he had lots to do still. He said, I've, you know, I've got these deals to sort out. And he was a bit annoyed he couldn't finish his deals. Um, but at the end, he was just, he just went peacefully. You sat with him. The psychology you know. side of things, like, did you give, get a better understanding of your dad, the way he functioned, the way he worked, the patterns that he'd done? Yeah, I think so. Did that ease your own mind? Yeah, understanding over the years, how... I did a lot of psychology, and I, you do all the different schools, and I found the schools that kind of helped make sense of him. Um, so I was kind of okay with it. I kind of, it's this thing of social character and character. You, once you've kind of been made that way, it's difficult to change that character. Um, you can change the, you know, what you're driving towards and you just wouldn't change that. I think as a young man, he'd got that buzz and this thing with the police and authorities and it was like a game and you just couldn't really give that up. I think normal life really bored him, you know, just sitting, you know, just sitting and watching TV or going for meals or he found that boring. Yeah. How was it writing the book? When did your dad pass? 2015? 2015, yeah. yeah. So the book, how, how was it writing the book and why is, is the it book. so been a delay in it? Um... I mean, he passed away. I was doing my degree at the time. Once I finished my degree, 
I wanted to do, study be psychotherapist, but you've got to go off and do your experience. And why I was doing that, I started writing the book. And it was great because it was like having my dad around every day. It was like I'd write about him. He'd come alive on the page. And I think, this is great. And I just love writing the book because it was like more and more stuff come back. So I enjoyed it. It was almost, like I said, I've always had that relationship where he's always out there. He's always out in Spain. He's on the run. He's in prison. He's always out there. He was never sitting at home coming in. He, you never expected him to come home at six o'clock. We never had that relationship. He was always out there. And it was like that with the book. Mm -hmm. it, for yeah. the two, two and a half years I wrote it, he was about again. And I could put everything in, not just the, the very best, but I could put some of the worst in it because it's got to be three-dimensional. It can't just be what a great guy he was because he was a flawed guy as well. He was a three-dimensional person, and he had a, lot of, a, bit of dark, a bit of a dark side, I guess. Uh, but the book, I, I love writing. I liked it to include everything as well. So it kind of, like I said, included the prison visits and stuff, which I thought was important to show, you know, the family side. Yeah. Because most books, they don't include that sort of thing. It's kind of important because it gives it a bit of depth. It gives it another layer. No, it's to get an understanding because we can glorify it. Like, like you say, yeah. your dad watching the films, it's, it's a turn on. It's yeah. an attraction. Like, yeah. I'll beat the system, I'll beat this, I'll make millions, I'll live that extravagant life. But even if your dad was making 100 million a month, it still wouldn't have stopped him. No. It, it wasn't, the money just, it wasn't really about the money. Yeah. I mean, at the end, he didn't have any, he didn't really have any money when he died. And he was quite happy because it was like, he'd spent it all. That's what it was for, spending and giving away. And take it with you. Yeah. How, where can people buy the book, Jason? Uh, you can buy it on Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, some good bookshops, you, you'll get it. But Amazon, I'll just go straight there. And we'll leave the link in the description. Just before we finish up, how do you feel like talking about that journey of your dad? Does it bring back some emotion like of his life and look passing and just... Yeah, like I said, he's, he's always going to be there with me now because it's kind of... Uh, Nick Davis sent me some intercepts the other day and then my dad on the phone and he's just saying, I'll be there in five minutes and, you know, I'm just coming down the road and all this sort of stuff. He's all, there's always a sense that he's around and with the book being out, it still feels like he's around. Mm. He's just in book form now and his, you know, his life's still there and he's still alive in a certain respects. Yeah. I just wish he, he could have seen it and what happened after he passed. For anybody <laughs> that's watching that's maybe stuck in a life of crime, what advice would you have for them? In the, in the long run, it, there's kind of no winners in it. I mean, me and my brother, we talk now and then and you think, all these people we used to know, how many of them did well out of it? There's almost none. Most of them do a lot of prison time. A um, few of them end up dead early. Um, it's, it's no, no way. There's no, there's no future. And that's part of the reason none of us went into it. It would have been easy just to say, oh, Dad, give us a pass or we'll, we'll you know. But none of us ever did that because it's like no future in this, really. It's not great quality in life. Always looking over your shoulder, always looking for surveillance and stuff. Uh, I always want to do something creative. You know, you can't do that with, in that sort of environment. So criminal life, I think it's entertaining. Um, at a distance but close up there's a lot more to it mm -hmm. and that's what a really a book should show it should show warts and all not just the you don't want to be glamorising stuff like that but it's only glamorous from a distance when you get up close it's not a nice business uh, and that should be shown really yeah your social media is as well Jason just in case anybody wants to get I'm in a, contact or ask questions what I'm what's like the old man of me mm -hmm. yeah I'm on Twitter I respond to most stuff there mm -hmm. um, and I'll be doing yeah I'll be doing all sorts over the next, next couple of months as well Jace, for coming on today and telling your story. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed that. I wish okay. you all the best for the future. God bless and safe drive home, brother. All right. Thank Cheers, you. Man. Thanks.